Ah, okay. Uh, just put A everywhere. <laughs> so, Morgan Hagrid will uh, um, present another implementation of the same philosophy when the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom are entangled. And he will try to identify similar features in uh, quantum dots. All right, so as uh, Dimitri said, I'll be doing my final presentation on polaron states for infrared emission in Perovsky quantum dot. So first, just like a real quick overview of quantum dots. They're nanoparticles of semiconductors, and they have these special properties due to their small size, and with this allows the transfer of electrons, which makes all this possible with the light emission when they're excited. And then a couple applications, um, a huge application for this right now is TV. Samsung makes a QLED TV that uses this technology which allows them to get these very nice colors with deep contrast. Um, another application uh, with the Perovsky quantum dots in particular is uh, solar panels, which is becoming um, a more used technology due to their high conductivity. So some of the important equations in, um, in this project here, uh, obviously the Hamiltonian, and uh, there's a couple different stages of that as well as the evolution operator which allows us to um, kind of see where these things are going to be going. And then a few other uh, parameters here and the Arrhenius equation, same as Yu-Gi-Oh's, um, looking at uh, activation energy. So there's a, a few different videos here. The first one is at a lower p naught, which is the um, initial momentum of this curve. Uh, it goes from the blue curve, which is the excited state, down to the, uh, the ground state, which is the red curve. And it is seen that um, the vibration is a lot higher in the ground state as compared to the excited state. It goes slow, but it's okay. It's always good. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is another one at a much higher initial momentum. Oh, and so this one ends up moving a lot quicker. And as you see in this one, the ground state is taking a lot longer to fluctuate. It's got a lot less vibrational energy because of this higher initial momentum. And then, uh, so for some data collection, uh, the way that it was done is to determine the rate Rather than uh, being able to use the rate that was came out of the code, um, it is seen here that this it's averaging this um, this overall rate, whereas it has to just be done you know, y over x and calculating the the rate that way because of the drop off at the other end. That uh, that data is not good for the collection that throws out the average. And with this, the um, the Arrhenius plot was made using the uh, 1 over temperature along with the rates that were gathered. And within this collection of data points, there was on the two extremes uh, a lot of discrepancy in the data, whereas in the middle it leveled off and formed a, a nicer curve in which this plot was taken from. And here, from here, the slope is where we get our activation energy. Any questions? Well, let's uh, thank Morgan for presentation. <laughs> and uh, paper is open for discussion and questions. On your slide that had the uh, wave packet moving, um, you gave it initial momentum for by the 50. Do those have units? Um, yeah, it's just the atomic units. Two? They're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? I didn't re realize how exactly 
Well, you show in actually two level system, which electronic system, which is coupled to the vibrational uh, mode, kind of electronic, right? Uh, and you just consider the evolution of your wave packet going from one electronic state to another through the kind of vibronic, vibronic uh, levels. How is it related to the perovskite? Um, so this is, it's kind of simulating as the, the perovskite is excited through, in this case it was infrared emission, it's showing that as this electron is added, it's the shortening and lengthening of the bonds that creates this jump of energy. But can I say that, for example, let selenite is also has a, um, uh, there, 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 you can excite it at the, uh, in, in really like in the infrared range because it's very narrow band gap semiconductor. Then all this story can be applied to the, let's say, let selenite crystal. Oh, I mean, right? Like any, actually, it's not really perovskites. It's any kind of mm. um, semiconductor crystal with a small band gap where the excitation, mm -hmm. right, is in an infrared range or maybe um, near infrared range, right? Yes. Okay. And let me advocate or add to uh, or something really about perovskites. Uh, um, the offset of blue and uh, red along x-axis is bigger in perovskite materials because the bonds are softer. In uh, more uh, solid crystals, they will be over, all, almost overlapping. So technically, you can make this offset of uh, levels and then say, well, I'm looking on a different relaxation rates in perovskites or perovskites with this type of anions like iodine, lead, or whatever, right? And this might be also kind of a further parameters which you can play with. Yeah. Nice. Okay, thanks. Uh, I do have a question. And it is very challenging. Uh, do, do not fear if you cannot answer, just try your best. Uh, show you a, a really nice point. So, uh, when Jung Yu was showing his Arrhenius point, <coughs> the slope was in the opposite direction, which means uh, like <laughs> this increase of temperature rate was higher. Yeah, in, so in, in your simulation, this increase of temperature rate is getting slower. How do you interpret it? If, if you can. Yeah, and initially when I was getting that, I was really confused because I was seeing, you know, when looking at other Arrhenius plots, and as well as Jungio, is it going in that negative slope? And I was confused at first, but then as I was looking back through the, the data that I was getting in my Excel plot, I was seeing kind of the opposite of what is traditional, and it was showing that as the temperature increased, with uh, as well as the P-naught was increased, the rates were actually decreasing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but is it similar to what Alisa was showing for her case? No, the connection is not, not straightforward. But can you bring uh, your potentials or anything which shows your two potentials? Curves, parabolas. Oh, the two. Right. Yeah, for example, here. So, um, how does. Um, blue parabola on the left, at which point of red parabola it, it inter, uh, they intersect? It intersects at the, the bottom portion of it. Yes, and uh, here I need to add, you, you answered everything correctly, but uh, this corresponds to activation-less uh, transition, which gives absolute maximum. Um, and any changes to the system compared to this configuration, either increasing temperature or changing offsets, you only slow down the reaction. Mm -hmm. So um, it, this surprise is expected. Okay. More questions to Morgan? If no, I thank you once again. <clears throat> and we are start, starting next uh, chapter consisting of only one presentation. Kristen <laughs> uh, <laughs> Atto. Um, her research project will be different from everything before. Her reaction coordinate will be not position of ions, but position of electrons. And there will be no nuclear motion. It will be only electronic degree of freedom along uh, uh, coordinate. And she is applying to some photovoltaic interfaces. Was yours? Yeah, so as Dr. Kilan said, my name is Kristen Patnam, and I'll be presenting on charge transfer between a perovskite semiconductor <coughs> and electronics of the titanium dioxide agent.
First, here I just have an image for you guys of the three-dimensional perovskite and then the one-dimensional projection. I'll speak a little bit on how we got the three-dimensional image into a one-dimensional projection in just a second, but just to familiarize yourselves with what this perovskite looks like in the MATLAB produced plots. You'll be seeing this throughout the rest of the plots in my entire presentation. So in order to first get that 3D image into a one-dimensional uh, projection, we had to collapse our three-dimensional potential into a one-dimensional potential. Um, to do this, you apply a double integral in order to remove your two uh, dimensions that we're not going to be using. And then we have normalization factor as well. Our potential is described um, with a relationship to our electric field, which is that capital E, um, which is going to be our main variable throughout, where that mu is just a constant. Our Hamiltonian is going to be used as well in order to uh, calculate our evolution operator. And so that Hamiltonian is also dependent on our potential. So we're going to notice a dependence of, of um, our probability of finding the electron in a specific space is going to be dependent on our applied potential. Um, that's because our evolution operator is dependent on that Hamiltonian, which is dependent on the potential. And so I just have a further explanation uh, to outline or identify that each different potential is going to correspond to a different electric field, um, which is just important to note. And you'll notice that in the plots, we do see a direct relationship between um, our change in potential and our electric field. Furthermore, in order to get a rate to determine how our electron is moving in and out of the perovskite semiconductor, we choose an eigenstate and then run our code initially. And then from that, we're going to plot a graph that's going to show us the population of the of electrons in our actual accepting agent versus in the semiconductor as a function of time and the rate of population we gain. And then in order to extract the rate from that, we'll do a derivative over time and convert that into um, a rate in picoseconds or inverse picoseconds. Here I have about one picosecond just to describe if we have an excited electron. You notice that at excitation orbitals about seven to nine, the rate of transition from electron in the semiconductor to the TiO2 agent was about one inverse picosecond. Um, it's predicted that at an excita without excitation of the electron, that rate will be close to zero. So here I have an image to demonstrate what looks what happens when you have a non-excited non-excited electron versus an excited electron in the perovskite semiconductor. Without exciting the electron and without applying a field there is not much movement in the electron. These are static images, I'll point that out right now. Um, but once you excite that electron, we see that it's almost impossible to predict where that electron would be as the probability of it existing at any point of the semiconductor or the TiO2 agent um, is almost the same. And so it would be impossible to determine where it is in that system. So then to give a few videos of what this looks like when we have no applied field and our initial eigenstate at no excitation, we're going to see the electron move. And then when we excite the electron, not much is going to change in that motion. You'll see some differences in intensity, but it's unlikely that the electron is going to move in or out of that semiconductor. However, once we start to apply a field here, I have just a demonstration of um, potential versus, excuse me, um, this is all those colored lines or eigenstates for each respective potential. Um, just to demonstrate what we're going to do, we're going to start at an initial eigenstate of ground, a ground eigenstate, and then excite it up to about seven or nine. And so in the middle is where we have no applied field, which is what we just looked at. And then we have both a negative and a positive field. And we're going to look at how those affect the electron's motion differently. So first, if you apply a positive field and you're at no excitation of the electron, the electron has a hard time moving outside of the semiconductor. To remind you, this middle section is our semiconductor, and then as we move this way, we get to our titanium dioxide accepting agent. So then once we excite the electrons, here we've excited to a state of nine, we see a lot more motion of the electron, and it actually makes its way outside of the semiconductor and even starts to populate that accepting agent. So then just to remind you, we're moving on to then apply a negative field and again, we're going to start at an initial ground state without exciting the electron. And then we'll excite the electron again to a state of about nine. And once again, we see that almost static electron inside the semiconductor. And then as we apply 
um, excitation, you notice the movement of the electron. And in this case, we actually saw even more motion towards the left side of the semiconductor, which I thought was interesting. That's just, um, that, is, that left side is not our accepting agent. So further research has to be done into why that happens. Also be interesting to do further work on optimizing photo excitation of the electron to see the most beneficial state of excitation um, to move that electron into your desired acceptor. And with that, I think, question. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> and presentation is open for discussion. I just have a conceptual question, so overall. So you kind of said that if you are in the ground state of, uh, in a perovskite uh, area, right? So then your electron stays there forever, right? Is it really not, true? Probably not forever. Okay. Likely. What is kind of quantum processes we know should, should, should happen even if the barrier is high? If it's not infinitely <laughs> large, then what happens with the electron? Inevitably, inevitably it will move. It will widen out the tunnel, right? Tunnel yeah. through the barrier. But uh, this process is just goes very, very slow. The mm -hmm. probability is very, very slow, uh, small, right? right? So that's why it's not like it's forever be there. It still probably will tunnel, but you probably need to wait weeks to see yeah. this, uh, some, something appearing at the other side of your barrier. Yeah. More questions? Okay, everyone is happy. Um, you said that when it goes, um, so you said that you apply negative and positive field, can you explain? And you also said excitation, but you didn't mean light excitation. It was not excited with light. Oh, sorry. What, so what kind of field? And what is negative positive? I actually know the answer. You <laughs> probably <laughs> do. Um, for the applied field, they will apply actually by that. What kind of field? An electric field. Okay. Applied electric field to the conductor, semiconductor. Um, but then within our code, we were able to excite the eigenstate conditions of the electron. But what does it mean, positive or negative? So you apply as a positive or negative voltage, in other words, right? Yes. But uh, did you show what happens if you apply negative voltage? That would be this image, this, these videos here, and then the first set, these are a positive voltage. I want to say it was 0.05 and negative point. Just verbally describe how What's the difference? potential plus or changes for positive and negative voltage, or positive and negative field. Just verbally describe how the potential changes. One slide um, forward. Yes. Because and there, there are three potentials. This field and uh, field of opposite science. science. Can you just um, verbally describe what's the difference in this thick uh, black curve? Because they look very similar. Yeah. So the primary difference that we see is actually on this left side. There's not, shouldn't be a change to the typing and accepting agent, but but this is with which field? This is with field, right? Yeah, so this example is with no field. Okay. And then when we apply the negative field is on this side. Oh, I'm sorry. Negative field is on this side. Um, and we... And on you, that side going, is... Going, on that side is your titanium, right? Yes, the titanium is all the way over. And on that side is your dye? Yes. Okay, so then what happens with the potentials plus minus? As the potential goes negative, our dye potential becomes a lot less uh -huh. defined and broader. Whereas when we have a positive, it becomes more narrow and more noticeable. Yeah, and for titanium, it's a backward behavior. Yes. So that's that's probably explains why you why you notice it goes either right or left. Yeah. Because you're really low in the barrier, either on the left side or the uh, right side. Huh. Can you, can you go to your equation slide? It seems you you were addressing the yeah. The second equation. Yes. So your potential under electric field is getting constant constant slope, where mu is your position at the radar. Right? So depending on the sign of the field, you you get positive or negative uh, additional component. Good. Um, question. Um, I'm wondering what are the parameters that go into the simulation. And for example, I mean, for every semiconductor, let's say the Bangkok value is one of the values. So what you're showing, does it depend on, let's say, the Bangkok value of dark sky and titanium dioxide? Does it depend 
on any intrinsic properties of the material at all, or is this very general that can be applied to any material? Good question. I didn't look into that. Yeah. In my... try, try your best and uh, maybe point attention to the first equation on your, on your screen. The question is, can you apply this to a fraction material that's different components? Or oh, maybe not perovskite. What if you change your materials? Instead of perovskite, you use something different. Polymers. Could you get with polymers? Since it's dependent on potential and not necessarily the intrinsic properties of your materials, I would. But potential can... does depend or not depend on the intrinsic properties of materials. So you can put on your material. <laughs> but you could. Likely and so. can you return back where you're showing how you go from 3D atomic structure? It is you. I mean, the image. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, here, right? So, right, look. Yeah, yeah. so uh, <coughs> who was making this plot? Actually, is it your? Did you simulate this well, you, structure well, you or you from, took it from uh, somewhere? Provided by Dr. Han. By who? Dr. Han. Oh, okay. And how he was doing it, do you know? That did, did you ask him? No. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have a Maybe, vision? Can you explain how did you obtain this? So it's from first principle. Okay, As a potential. From mass. Uh, do, do you think everyone, um, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure not everyone knows what is what. <laughs> well, you need to, to apply right special code which allows you to calculate the yes. with some approximations you actually need to calculate the to, to solve the so is equation. It, <laughs> is it just the um, electrostatic potential? Okay. Um, so let's say you, you calculate the electrostatic potential from this wait, 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 and you project on, on a two dimensional and you just one dimensional. Yes. So it is uh, first principle data. Right. So you see, this is, you know, this care property is, is intrinsic to the property, uh, to the material that you're talking about, right? If you, instead of, um, if you replace, let's say, that of sky with something else, mm -hmm. the curve is going to be different. Yes. And then your final results going to be different. Right? And if the molecule is different, then probably yeah. you also will have slightly different shape for the right side for the potential, mm -hmm. same for the technique. Because very strongly depends on the material. All right. More questions? Let's uh, thank Kristen once again for extending the, the, the questions. <laughs> and now we are starting the uh, last chapter of, of three sections. So uh, if you uh, first uh, will be presented by Amelia Anderson, and uh, she will uh, help us to recall principles of uh, war theory, which is behind atomic spectroscopy. Yeah, so like you said, my name is Amelia, and I did my project on the 2D rotation of a Bohr model for non-equilibrium orbitals. Uh, some of the equations I used, I um, used this first equation, which was uh, which converts angular momentum to polar coordinates, so we could um, plot the um, angular momentum in a way that we can understand it on the Bohr model. And then the second equation is, uh, it shows the difference between kinetic and potential energies and how they're related to Hamiltonian. Uh, my methods, I used a MATLAB code written by Dr. Killen, and then um, I added the commands to automatically save the videos um, so I could upload those to YouTube later so I can add them to my presentation. Um, I changed the numbers of nodes and then reran uh, the code so we can uh, see how the nodes changes the angular momentum of the electron movement. And then we analyzed how, uh, how those nodes affect the movement. Um, so here is just a polar standing wave. Um, and the red line on there, they're all kind of overlapping. But just imagine with me, and we'll see them on later plots. Um, the red line is the real part of the wave function, and the green line is the imaginary part. And then the blue line is the combination of those, which is the red line squared plus the green line squared and the absolute value of that. And then um, the blue line shows the um, stability of the electron in each node and orbital. Um, so if the blue, 
um, later in the videos if the blue line is um, pretty much unmoving, then the electron is going to be more stable. And if it's moving, then the electron is not stable and will um, quickly change so it will become more stable. And then it's less likely to undergo a transfer to a different node. Um, so here's the first node. Um, we, or I ran it with 1.56 nodes, and the, you can see the very quick movement of both the red, green, and uh, the combination of the two in the blue line. So um, when there's not an even integer <coughs> number of nodes, then the, uh, then the electron is a lot less stable, and it's going to try to get back to a more stable state. And then the second one, we did 2.02 nodes. Uh, so clearly, those movements are a lot uh, more stable, and the combination of the red and the blue makes, or the red and the green makes the blue light unmoving. So this electron is uh, pretty stable in its condition. And then moving forward, here's 2.64 nodes. And um, this is unstable once again because it's not an even integer. Um, and then finally, here's three nodes, 3.01 nodes, and um, this is stable once again, uh, and that blue line is unmoving, so it's uh, happy in its current condition. And then, um, so conclusions for this project was as the number of nodes change, the radius from the nucleus increases as the number of nodes increase um, if we go back and just compare the, um, the radius of each of these, it clearly gets larger as we move forward and find the largest at three nodes. And then, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, the even integer values create smoother movements and um, more stable atoms. And then the value of orbitals is two times the number of the nodes. So uh, there's one positive and one negative for each node. And then finally, we looked at limitations of the Bohr model. So it's only a 2D model. Um, so it can't show uh, 3D movement. And uh, that led to the lack of understanding of what the electron would do in a 3D space. Those are some references. OK, thank you. Amelia. The end of the presentation is open for discussion. So you, in your conclusions, you said that you need the integer number for the for the nodes, right? Yes. So in other words, you need to quantize uh, your, your momentum, your angular momentum should be quantized, yes. right? And this is very valid, of course, statement, mm -hmm. which you proved. However, you didn't show the results with 300. You were showing 301, 302 point something. Yes. Was it some, is it an issue to get exactly the even number for your code? Um, or you just didn't show it was? Because it's, we, it's not interesting. <laughs> Well, there's that. But um, the code <laughs> did not run as well with completely even integers. We wanted to have um, three uh, significant figures in each value of the nodes. So we just ran it not completely equal, but we got it as close. So in other words, there's some bug in your code which not allowing you to really get exactly integer number. Yes. So there's maybe some uh, numerical errors which yes. results that you need in yeah. a kind of a, a little correction and you mm -hmm. cannot really get the uh, exact even number. Yes. More questions, please. So um, can we use this simple picture that you got to understand any no observation in experiment? Yes, any simple experiment that uh, some experimental data um, where we can use this picture to understand? Um, uh, I mean, you could use it in a multitude of different experiments if you're able to. Um, this is kind of atom by atom, not the complication of a molecule. So, um, yeah, the blue line just, if it's stable, then the electron is going to be less likely to transfer. But if you're looking at an atom where um, the blue line is moving all over the place, then the electron is going to be more likely to transfer. And that we just, well, I looked at it as. The electron is more likely to transfer from the end. Yes. Or move to a state where it can be more stable within that. 
But can you really give some example of this experimental evidence of something like that? Is there a connection to hydrogen Some experimental hydrogen evidence of the Bohr model. <laughs> Um, uh, I did not look into that. Come so on. You, you can, you can. What exactly is the reason why Bohr created his model? There was very clear need from experimental side why he really stopped working on it. And how he proved that his model is right. Um, uh, he looked at... Um, Let's go to your questions. Maybe they will help you. So you you asked the question uh, what does it tell? Um, at the values of even integers of nodes, the um, don't exactly know. So what what is h? Which, and uh, which um, observable which dimension corresponds to? Momentum, position, or start with letter E. <laughs> Observable, it, uh, eigenstate of Hamiltonian, but it can be kinetic or potential. Okay. Yes. Good. So if you plug in uh, the quantized values, or if you um, look that you have integer number of nodes, what could be the values of, of energy from this Hamiltonian equation? Would you get different energies for different uh, values of your quantized L? And how is it changing? <coughs> if L grows, energy. So energy. Energy grows. Mm -hmm. And because L is quantized, then what happens with energy? Like L cannot take something in between because then your atom is unstable. Mm -hmm. Then you really need to take all integer numbers for L, right? Then what, how does it affect the energy? Does energy continuously changing when you? Or it takes only discrete values. Takes only discrete. Values. Discrete values, which depends on this L, right? Mm -hmm. And now go back to experiment. How does the hydrogen, uh, the spectral hydrogen atom looks like in the visible range? It's very discrete values. Actually, there are four discrete lines, mm -hmm. right? And this was kind of a main puzzle. No one could explain before Bohr. Why is it discrete? Why is it not kind of a distribution like mm -hmm. you see from the black body radiation, which is just spread it kind of distribution in all, over, over all energies, right? Yeah. And this exactly explains if you have one single electron in a hydrogen atom moving from the ground state to the first, <coughs> the first second, and so on, excited states, right? Results on a discrete energies. If they go in a visible range, you really can see them just by eye. And, and this is the evidence of this uh, model. It works. He was able to use this model and predict this energies, which then were compared with the hydrogen atom spectra, and they looked very nicely there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm not sure whether you were thinking about yeah, this experiment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, people propose a model for purpose. Mm -hmm. They were trying to understand stuff. And usually it comes from there. Yeah. So that's why I, mean, I wanted to see the connection. Yeah. Right. More questions? Morgan? No? It's not questions, it's applause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, thank you. So we have uh, two more presentations. Uh, Stephen uh, will be the next. And um, he, his presentation will be very much different from anything we heard before, and very much different from anything uh, you may have heard in the previous years of this class. So instead of uh, looking on either electronic or nuclear degrees of freedom, he will look on to spin degrees of freedom. Hi, my name is Stephen Rastrin, and I'm a stuff with Kevin. I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom. So we can't hear you. Can oh, sorry. Do, do, do we need to launch uh, the presentation mode? Oh, right, right, right. 
You can't tell, I'm a little nervous. All, okay. I've, all I've had to eat today is coffee. <laughs> so, you can take, if you are not in the good mood to all the Hello? Uh, yeah. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Yep. So, my name is Steve Rusher, and as Dr. Kellen said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, spin degrees of freedom in electrons, and specifically the free induction decay of electrons and electrons in NMR. So, first, uh, we're going to have to cover some theory, since as I said, mine is very different from everyone else's. So, that would be what exactly is spin? And that is a very hard question. <laughs> if it wasn't, I'd probably have a Nobel Prize winner. So it's an intrinsic property of electrons and other fundamental particles, which doesn't really tell us anything. It's uh, more actually, it's a form of angular momentum of a particle. And probably the analogy, it's a ball that's spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. So then what is it? Well, specifically, the spin number of an electron is the eigenvalue of a wave equation for the k number of states where the wave function is an eigenfunction of s hat z for the summation of k terms of s hat z k. So that would be the uh, basically the z uh, value for a, uh, a vector of uh, magnetization, basically. So that allows us to see that they'd be represented by a sphere basis. That would be a block sphere. Well, what is a block sphere? It's a geometric, geometric representation of a qubit where the poles of the sphere represent the 0 and 1 states. Uh, more usefully, it's a way of visualizing the magnetic vector of a spinning electron as it moves uh, through a magnetic field. So we have our magnetic vector is equal to uh, g, summation of k of the s k of time t, where the s k is the combination of the x, y, and z components of the vector, which are controlled by uh, these uh, equations, which I will show later. So, now what is a spin echo? So, as the magnetic moments of a, a group of electrons move around a block sphere, on, around the equator, that at one point in time, they will synchronize and constructively combine their signals into one very large signal. Now, the exact time that this happens for an atom is unique to each atom and to each electronic environment, or so how it's bonded uh, for every single state that there can be. This is the principle behind how NMR spectroscopy can differentiate elements and atomic structure this way. And now we have a very, very messy graph. So what's happening on this graph is that all of our uh, electrons in the magnetic moment in the ensemble start at the same level the uh, pulse, the half pi magnetic pulse that brings the electrons from the poles of the, mag of the block sphere onto the equator, which is represented by these two lines, at which point the varying uh, individual frequencies that they move around the equator, uh, which is dependent on their individual electronic environment, cause them to diverge into these various uh, purple and yellow orange lines until they reach the pi pulse which uh, flips them 180 degrees in the sphere. And as you can see, that changes the way so that now instead of diverging away from one point on the sphere, they are now on the opposite side, converging towards a separate point on the opposite side, which is represented here and here. And so we have two identical signals, despite the fact that they are now in different places in time and space. And so a more Useful visualization if you can't really wrap your head around that. We have our electrons here at the top of the block sphere, which are then moved to the equator by the 90 degree or half pi pulse, so that they are now in the xy plane of the sphere. They then proceed, the various uh, electrons, since this is more than one, move in various ways around the sphere at different rates, and that's such they uh, counteract and destructively combine to reduce the total of the signal that you would see. This is until the pi pulse is uh, received by them, at which point they flip to the opposite side of where their positions were originally on the sphere, and they now begin to converge to a single point on the opposite side of the sphere. So, a nice thing I got from Wikipedia shows this in a smooth motion. 
And then you see that at one point they converge on the opposite side and uh, form a new signal, even though that there shouldn't be any uh, magnetization present. Now, what did I do exactly? Well, as the electrons move, they move at different rates. The specifically, it's called the uh, this, the disorder is the variance between uh, each individual magnetic moment as it moves. So, I stated earlier, they are defined by the summation of the x, y, and z coordinates, which are defined by various differential equations. The important uh, variable in this is the plus or minus i delta omega k. They do so at different rates. The difference between those is defined by the delta omega k. So here are the two electrons, not the, the two formulas that I used earlier in the uh, formula to divine, define the uh, magnetic vector. And here we have the delta uh, omega k uh, components, which are the important factors. So in the MATLAB code, delta omega k is represented as a multiple of omega. As you can see here, the original was uh, 0.015, where this can be rep x represents any uh, value that would differentiate between the different uh, speeds that they move. With x is uh, starting at 0.01 in 0.025 increments uh, up to uh, 0.02. So what does that look like? So here we see the signal that you would receive on the block sphere, where as they move around the uh, equator at different rates, they destructively uh, counteract each other's signal until they converge at a single point, and we see a sudden surge in signal on the opposite side. Now, graphed to link to the YouTube video that uh, Dr. Killen helped me put together, oh, that I took that from. If we graph that, we see this sort of graph, where the uh, the orange and blue line combined represent the uh, measured magnetic signal. Now, as you can see, as disorder increases, this is uh, 0.01, uh, 0.0125, 0.015, and increasing so on to 0.02, the uh, width of the peak increasingly narrows the larger the disorder is between them. So this is a very important as uh, the width of the peak uh, is a limitation in the resolution ability of an NMR to distinguish different uh, electronic states. So if we graph that as a combination of the area of the peak over the multiples of W, we see this very smooth uh, sloping uh, trend line as the disorder of, uh, of the state of the magnetic moments increases. And the, it says T2. I'm sorry, I did not uh, define what that is. T2 is the relaxation time, the time that it takes for an electron that's been put through a magnetic uh, field and been brought to the XY plane to return to its initial uh, sort of state after it's removed from the electronic field. This uh, value is different for every uh, element and is part of the, the way that spin echo is used as a way of uh, determining the, the state of the atom. So what happens if we make the disorder really, really large, like seven times as large as the original one that uh, we started with? And something very interesting happens. The total area of the peak completely breaks down, and the, it loses all symmetry. There is no symmetrical large peaks on either side, and what I'd speculate about what's causing this at this point is that the disorder is so large between each individual magnetic moment that they aren't able to uh, immediately constructively rephase into a single point. By the time the first ones are rephasing, the other electron magnetic moments are still far around the sphere, and by the time the last ones are rephasing, the first ones have already returned to their initial values. Question. Okay, but thanks, Stephen. Now we're almost 10 minutes. <laughs> and presentation is open for discussion. Yes? You mentioned that this is kind of applicable to the NMR spectroscopy. Yes. But then you were also talking about, like initially, I think you said it several times, that you talk about spin of an electron. What is used in NMR? What kind of spin they use? Is it for electrons or for something different? I might have confused some there, but... 
the important part is that. Uh, so uh, it doesn't change the overall, how to say, physics and uh, formulas which you were showing. Algebraic processing in an atom. Are there anything else spin which has spin, spin, or it's only electrons which do have spin? It's what about protons? All uh, elementary particles and quarks have spin. However, in the nucleus of an atom, they believe they are counteracting. Is proton a fermion or not? No. Pro a proton? A single proton? Yes. <laughs> proton is a fermion, right? But if, if, yes. if, you, if, you, if you talk about nucleus, right, it depends on whether you have even or odd numbers and they might be not fermions. So, in NMR, it's the same idea, but my understanding is that they talk about the spin of the nucleus. Spin of the protons. So in, in your talk, you can uh, replace only one letter if you want to speak about electrons instead of NMR. Or EPR. EPR, yes. Okay. More questions to Steven? If not, then thank you once again. <laughs> Please don't leave it here. So the uh, next presentation uh, is by John Swanson. So um, his presentation will be also very unlike and similar to anything you heard before. In the uh, recent uh, year or couple of years, there was an interest to uh, so-called two-dimensional quantum materials, and uh, John was brave enough to try to apply uh, skills from the course for uh, exotic materials. Are you in a mood to speak loud or you need to? I'd rather you speak loud. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is John Swanson. I will be presenting on the correlation between eigenstates as the magnetic field is changed. Um, so getting into that, um, just brief overview, not that people don't know what superconductors are, but a uh, superconductor is a material which can move electrons from one atom to the next with no resistance. And so this is often researched on low temperatures, bringing metals down to low temperatures, they can become superconductors in many cases. Um, but one area of research that maybe isn't as looked into or known about is the application of magnetic fields um, to form superconductors and metals. Because I know metals oftentimes, when they are superconductors, give off magnetic fields, but inducing them with a magnetic field may have um, a similar result to bringing it to lower temperatures if we look into that a bit. So, some basic methods of research. Um, there's a MATLAB code that was used to do this experimentation. I'll get a little bit into what was behind that. And so, through this, we um, took the eigenstates that were found through this code, and they were converted to density of states um, across energy. And then that was used to determine if a superconductor could be formed based on how the density of states um, reacted. And so some equations that were helpful in doing this. Um, this first equation relates the Hamiltonian to energy in the eigenstates. Um, and a lot of these are really intertwined, so actually doing this computationally may be incredibly challenging, which is why a code was used, because I'm not sure I could do any of this by hand. Um, second one equation right here, we found, um, use the energy found in the first equation um, and use in the first equation to find the density of states. And then moving past that, this equation is used alongside this once this is solved and it can be plugged back in, as you can see here. And then this is just an equation for the Hamiltonian with L sub Z being angular momentum, V sub Z being um, magnetic field, and both of these are actually in the um, momentum um, space and not in any position. position. Yes. Thank you. What is LU and H L? Okay, so LU is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, highest occupied, and so for this one, lowest is um, calculated using positive, highest using negative. So. And so a little bit of a representation of this last code here. Um, this is this cone is kind of what that equation looks like when mapped out in again in the momentum space. And this ky and kx are represented as px and py here. Um, and so the top is the lowest unoccupied, bottom is the highest occupied um, 
corresponding to the positive and negative. And then this over here is a material that this could be um, researched upon. So this is the top. This is the model of layered on um, bismuth telluride, and it's just one of the um, lattices of that. And so this is something that the experimentation done could be done upon. Okay, so for the actual data, um, at the bottom here, the areas are the eigenstates um, across energy that were found through the experimentation. And above each of these um, is a corresponding density of states that were found um, when converted. So these first three, this is throughout the slides I'll show. This is as the magnetic field increases. And these first three are pretty similar. As you can see, this is the density of states um, of the poles where there weren't electrons in the uh, lattice and then of the electrons found. And the dotted line you'll see is the combination of the two of those. So nothing really too interesting here. Um, as the magnetic field is increased even more, um, you start to see that there is a bit of a dip here, which started to grow, as you can see in that last one, almost forming a peak. Um, and then finally, um, here we can see this is the strongest peak that was found through this experimentation. I'm sure it could be found stronger if you were to get to closer values, but this is what was found. Um, and then it started to dip down. And so what was determined from seeing this peak in the density of states is that it is evidence for a superconductor. Um, I believe you can look at, look at Fermi's golden rule for showing that when the density of states increases at a specific energy um, so sharply, it could indicate that a superconductor is being formed. And so again, it, it flattens out afterwards, but that is as a magnetic field is increased, that is something that is known to happen for density of states. So that doesn't prove this is true, but it gives further evidence that this is reliable. Um, and so this is just a video of all of those kind of mapped out, kind of what that would look like, just for a little bit of a better visualization of the density of states over time. Okay, so some observations that could be made here again by Fermi's golden rule. Um, we can claim that as density of states increase at one specific energy, that um, you could maybe see a superconductor being formed. And so, um, further indication of this was found when looking at the eigenstates of the found through this experimentation. And so, I'm not going to show all of them because there's a lot, but um, I picked a specific few. So, when the B field is zero, uh, I believe this is the first eigenstate and the third one, um, according to our graphs on an earlier slide. Um, there's relatively little to see here, which indicates there's little motion. And so as we move up in the magnetic field, this should be um, negative 2.33 times 10 to negative 5. Um, there is a lot more fringes here, as seen by the second eigenstate and the fifth one, that's why I believe these two are. And the fringes should indicate that there's further motion within these eigenstates. And that continues up to um, negative 4 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, and this is at a much higher energy and a much lower energy. But as you can see, there is a lot of um, activity going on there, which further indicates that there is motion, which would lead you to believe that maybe a superconductor could be formed under these conditions. Yes, I so yes. this is just different eigenstates at the same um, uh, at the same magnetic field, right? You no, fix no. the strength, so, you, so you're changing it. This this is magnetic field is zero. This is increased to two point three three times seven. Which is kind of optimal, where you really see yeah. the formation. Of the and then the, the largest peak was seen at this one, um, and so this is at a higher energy. But this is as the magnetic field is increased. This is just a couple of the eigenstates taken out of that. And so observations, again, I said, as it fringes increase, that we just believe that there's an increase in motion. Um, and there are the eigenstates, and my units are not quite great. But they're there. Can't change them now. Um, and so basically what I took out of this is upon induction of a magnetic field, it could lead us to believe that a superconductor could be formed under the right conditions, which I think is something that's very interesting. So thank you.
Yeah. 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 Yeah, Sorry, I'm one of the students in that question. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're ready to upload infinitely. Okay, Alyssa. Um, can you go back to, uh, just keep going, I'll tell you this match. Okay, uh, right here. Yeah. Um, so on the first one, uh, that you have, why are the states less quantized? Like, going up, there's like obviously not like plateaus. Do you know like why it gets so weird? Like, like, you mean with? Um, nope, the bottom graph. Here? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, because they're not, so this dip, um, I know I looked into it at some point. Um, I think it indicates a change in the motion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm not entirely sure why it goes from, you know, the tiers to that kind of steadily increasing pattern. But I guess they're just because that I guess they can probably be taken from different spots that aren't necessarily in one um, plane. Um, because I guess they are kind of correlating to this conic shape. Um, but I could be mistaken in that. Uh, great question and, and answer is almost complete. <laughs> can you uh, uh, indicate our attention to magnetic field equals zero? And uh, count how many uh, degenerate eigenstates you see if you start from lowest? Here? Yeah, no degeneracy for the lowest. And next one, how Four. many? How many? Four. How many? Four. Four. Yes. Four. Okay, now let's go to your eigenstates at the very end. I mean, here. Eigenstates, not uh, Oh, I see. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So, um, can you explain how this degeneracy one and four relate to uh, your eigenstates with zero field? Hmm. So this is at zero energy. Z um, zero magnetic field. Zero, thank you. And zero, zero magnetic field. And so um, at the degeneracy of one and four, you can see that both of these are, um, well, they're basically the same, at least in this, which oh. indicates that both state there's little interaction but I'm not exactly um, sure that's what you're getting at. Does momentum uh, he, he's on the right way. We, we, we will complete this one. And thank you much Elisa for for great question. Um is momentum changing or conserved in absence of magnetic field? It appears to be conserved. Conserved. So uh, if you create a state with very certain value of momentum, delta function of momentum, is there any mechanism to, to disturb it? No. No. So uh, on your grid points for different values of momentum, please keep, keep this uh, again. On uh, any value of grid point, the delta function certifying very specific value of momentum will be an eigenstate because there are no reasons to change eigenstate. Right? And uh, if you take uh, square lattice grid points, how many nearest neighbors are close to 0.0? You, you already answered that. Let's uh, focus on the uh, back. This is zero point. <laughs> How many closest neighbors to this point along this grid grid lines? One, two, three, four. In all of them, you have the same value of uh, energy because it is proportional to those numbers. So it's four degrees. And it will be spiked from stages of one, the jury one, the jury is Can you go back to your uh, degeneracy images? This magnetic field zero. And can you maybe, uh, yeah. Can you now uh, repeat the same to Alisa and pointing right uh, things on there? I can do my best. So here, um, momentum is conserved as we go across. And so the closest four. Um, are seen up here to 
What was your question? You, your question, <laughs> your question was more your based question on... question was why it's so smooth. Yeah, on the this first, one. Uh, Rather than... Well, on, and then it goes this. back to being... Like, when it goes back to deep, it goes back to being normal again. I guess I, I don't... I was just wondering if there's like a... A reason why it goes from... I, I get exactly what you're asking. Why it goes from the tears to kind of a more curved pattern and then back to the tears again. Because of the discrete nature of, of grid points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it could be a num numerical artifact. If okay. we take finer grid points, it may disappear. Okay. More work. Yes. All right, can you get back this slide with a picture of uh, Bismarck Telluride? Yes, for sure. So Bismarck Telluride is a narrow Vanguard sentiment that the Vanguard is our 0 0.1 sentiment, mm -hmm. 11 points. So on the other left, you show something which is more like metal, more like graphene. And I didn't see any bang yet. You know, um, so do you think that your model on the left can be applicable to the material on the right? I think a similar model might be, but maybe not this specific one. Um, this is more of an example of something that has been used with superconductors that this may be able to be applied for, because I know this has been used to insulate and make quantum computers with um, just some research that has recently been done. But I'm not sure if this exact model would be applicable to this. I mean, the whole idea is uh, you, know, you can use a uh, magnetic field to manipulate the electronic state in the Vanguard uh, Vanguard for example. Um, OK, then that's it. OK, my question is very simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know of any example of real material where they observe um, you know, conduct, uh, superconductivity by, by applying uh, the magnetic field. In my research, I could not find anywhere that this was um, observed in any material, but um, this was more just to show that maybe it could be found to be applied to some material, but um, I could not find any evidence of a material that has been shown to have that um, functionality yet. Uh, have you seen an opposite effect when increase of magnetic field so limits the conductivity? Like your regime when you keep increasing it higher yeah. values? Well, um, eventually, like if you look <coughs> here, um, as the magnetic field is continually increased, eventually it does start to... It, it lowers the conductivity. Lower the conductivity. This, this is very standard effect of certain experiments. So half of these results are Groovy's experiment. Okay. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> the other half is more the the part that would be interesting to put further research into based on this evidence. I don't know, typically in my is um, you know, when you had enhanced uh, the enhancement of the electronic um, electronic electronic studies at the factory level, it may lead to superconductivity. But yes, you know, it doesn't mean that if you had enhancement, yeah, you have to have a conductor. Right? It, yeah. You may have it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> yeah, yes, right. More questions to John? I have a general question, which is kind of related. Oh, I would say the answer to my question was already answered mm -hmm. in a question from Han, uh, uh, Khan. And, um, so technically, this bismuth telluride, right? So it's referred to the so-called Dirac materials because uh, it's not small semiconductor; it's a Dirac materials, means they completely close the gap at one point, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what other materials do you know which behave in the same way? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, and anyone from audience may uh, help to answer this question. It takes longer time. I do not know of any names directly. You should. Um, I should. This is very common material. I would be very surprised the, if you have never layers? seen it. Because I know graphene, for example. Yeah, this is yeah, one. Like this is the most common one, yeah. right? So, uh, but there are, of course, more than one yeah. material like that. And technically, the computational chemistry was applied to create some kind of a prediction, so database, they tried to go through many variations of possible semiconductors of multiple combinations, metal, non-metals, mm -hmm. whatever, and calculating electronic structure, the, the, the dependence energy on the band, uh, on, a, on a 
yeah, on the key points and checking whether you can get the uh, direct materials or not. And yeah, we found about hundreds of materials as predicted. Some of them not synthesized yet. More questions to John? If no, please uh, join me in uh, <laughs> and uh, last uh, note that uh, probably all visitors will agree that uh, it was a successful presentation. Please submit if you did this uh, form and class that attendees can also do this. Um, so the exposure of uh, class attendees to unbiased uh, problems was a chance to practice your knowledge in more real life environment and uh, there is a hope that it will um, help to keep part of the knowledge more um, long lasting in your memories and it will eventually help in uh, your in other classes like in organic PCAM2 uh, computation chemistry, which all you are invited to take, and uh, in your academic teaching or industrial careers. With this, uh, let me thank uh, all speakers and uh, participants of the discussion. So yes. may I just make a comment because I was coming for uh, Dmitry is teaching this course for about four, four times already, right? For three. Yeah. Anyway, I was. I was coming for this presentation of students from previous years, at least four, I think it was four times already. And I really was amazed with your presentations as a group, because usually, yeah, there are of course good presentations, very good presentations, but there are really presentations which are kind of very weak and very, people don't know what they do, we don't know how to answer questions. I was very, very pleased to see that all, how many eight people who were presenting really showing very, very good understanding, level of understanding was very high, and overall presentations were just interesting to listen to you. It was interesting to see what you were doing. So really, I think as a group, every of you was really, I don't know, I, I have, I'm very excited seeing your presentations. Really great work, guys. Okay. And this, uh, with this meeting is dismissed, <laughs> and class is complete. <laughs> so, okay, all right. I forgot to say that I, I you know, fully agree with Stadlana. I'm really impressed with you guys uh, from the end of the presentation skills. Um, uh, you know, it's much better than any other events that I've seen. Um, yeah, be proud of yourself. And <laughs> yeah, you lots of improvement. In we are proud of you, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, like it builds up steam and when you have the side, it's like, oh, like it was seven, but I consider eight is my number. <laughs> Oh, oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Dr. Han. I really appreciate your support. The code did it. Also, I have an answer to your question. Um, oh, yeah.
Well, you're asking about the potential for challenging and this parallel and so one of them has I haven't So like that's how it works. So it's it was in my I <laughs> 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 Well, I'll see you next semester.